It's my real pleasure to welcome you uh, here today. My name is Sonu Beatty. I'm an associate professor of government here and also the director of the Ethics Institute. It's my real pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Robert Post. So let me say that this is the Dorset Fellow Lecture Series on Free Speech on College Campuses. Uh, the Dorset Fellowship was established in 2001 when the Frederick Gardner Cottrell Foundation in conjunction with Research Corporation Technologies made a significant donation in honor of Bert Dorset, a class of 53, establishing an endowed fund. The purpose of the Dorset Fund is to honor the exemplary business career of Bert Dorset by bringing practitioners of ethics, leaders, physicians, engineers, and or scholars of ethics to the Dartmouth campus, uh, and they provide public lectures, meet with students, as Professor Post did uh, today. Uh, Debbie Dorset is often with us, but she's not here uh, today. I also want to thank Diane Belbeck in the back. This wouldn't be possible without all her hard work. Uh, and so let me say that when I organize this series on free speech on college campuses, I don't know if any of you have been, did any of you come to the first one with, oh good, we, okay. first was uh, Jeffrey Stone, second was Jelani Klob, and then of course Robert Post uh, rounds it out in the spring. Actually, when I f formed this, uh, Professor Post was first in my mind. I just then needed to go backwards and figure out who else I was going to bring. Uh, he is the Sterling Professor of Law at Yale Law School. Just you know, the Sterling distinction is the highest name distinction that the Yale uh, uh, can offer uh, a faculty member. He's also served as the Dean of Yale Law School from 2009 until till 2017. You know, he teaches in the areas of constitutional law, First Amendment theory, equal protection. He's written numerous books, uh, many law review articles, uh, too many actually to name. And I will say that uh, he is one of the few scholars that understands uh, that the law uh, should be understood or situated in a larger uh, humanist tradition. And so, uh, uh, you know, um, I've always found his work to be very important to my own. In fact, I've also assigned his uh, work on free speech in my class on theorizing uh, free speech. Uh, he's a member of the American Philosophical Society and the American Law Institute and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, and a former member of the Board of Directors of the American Constitution Society. And let me say that in addition to being a noted scholar, uh, I'll make an editorial comment here. He's also uh, a very nice human being. And uh, you should know that he met with students today and you know it ran from 12.30 to 1.30 and he basically stayed with students as long as they wanted. Uh, to talk with him. Uh, and so it's that kind of generous spirit uh, that, uh, in part, uh, made me think this would be a perfect person uh, to bring to campus. And so it's a great privilege of mine uh, to have uh, Robert Post deliver uh, our final Dorset Lecture Series on free speech on college campuses with the provocative title, right, if you haven't already read it, What We Get Wrong About Free Speech and the University. So Professor Post, please tell us what we get wrong. Thank you so much, Sonu. It's such a pleasure to be here. Darth, it's my first time, and I'm bowled over by how beautiful it is and how wonderful my hosts are, and uh, what a pleasure it is to be in this, uh, in this university. So um, I, the theme is uh, what we get wrong. I'm going to uh, talk about um, an error that moderns have. We tend to be very condescending to the past. We tend to think, oh, uh, they got it wrong. We're modern. We got it better. And in particular, we tend to think about the 19th century legal scholars, formalist. They understood rights to be abstract. They didn't understand that rights were there to serve particular purposes. And so they made endless mistakes in their jurisprudence in the 19th and early 20th century, which we moderns are exempt from because we're modern after all. <laughs> We've thought through these questions. And um, the basic point of this lecture is, um, is Faulkner's point that the past is not dead. It's not even past. We're subject to exactly those mistakes. We address our First Amendment jurisprudence in exactly that same formalist um, spirit. And I could, I could give you endless examples, but the particular text that I'm going to talk to you about with regard to that has to do with free speech on the universities, which, as you know, is a white hot um, issue, very controversial in college campuses. Um, all around the country. So, for example, I mean, I, I, it's it's important to understand the rhetoric in which this controversy is cast. So, Betsy DeVos, who's our new, or not so new now, our our Secretary of Education, just a few weeks after she was confirmed, 
said, I'm quoting her, the real threat in modern universities, modern universities is silencing the First Amendment rights of people with whom you disagree. The First Amendment rights of people with whom you disagree. Or take our Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, who uh, recently said, and I'm quoting him, freedom of speech on the American campus is under attack. And he said that universities should abide, and I'm quoting his exact language, by what the late Justice Antonin Scalia rightly called the first axiom of the First Amendment, which is that, as a general rule, the state has no power to ban speech on the basis of its content. So First Amendment rights, no content discrimination, universities regulate speech on the base of content. This is a terrible thing, says Sessions, because as Betsy DeVos says, as you see endlessly in this controversy, universities are therefore, therefore denying the First Amendment rights. And Sessions says this should especially be true of public universities, obviously. He's a lawyer. Uh, he knows that the First Amendment doesn't apply to private universities like Dartmouth, so you don't have to worry about the, you know, about the First Amendment, but everyone believes that the First Amendment rights of freedom of speech ought to, uh, in paramateria, apply to private schools like um, Dartmouth. And I could pick, I could throw a dart at any newspaper and pick out a story where, on the one hand, people are saying students want safety, but on the other hand, that violates freedom of speech. Freedom of speech, First Amendment rights, student insecurity, student safety, and these are viewed as incommensurate zero-sum goals, and we have a tension. If you give to one, you lose the other. That's the way this issue is formulated, and that formulation has led to serious legal consequences. So um, if you know ALEC, which proposes legislation to states, it's proposing free speech on universities legislation. Tennessee has just passed one, which says freedom of First Amendment rights, First Amendment rights should apply on college campuses throughout the state of Tennessee. California has a, uh, a similar uh, law, a Leonard Law, that uh, similarly provides. And um, this complaint actually exists both on the left and on the right. So the president of the University of California invoked First Amendment protections when she complained that we have moved from freedom of speech on campuses to freedom from speech. So that's the president of the University of California. On the other hand, many conservative commentators argue that pro-life speakers are unwelcome and conservatives are demonized, even banned from campuses for believing that ideas written into America's constitutions have meaning in modern America. Farewell, First Amendment and remainder of the Bill of Rights. There's an organization called FIRE, which is the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, which if you go to its website, it's, a, well, it's like ACLU, it represents litigants, and it says it's there to protect First Amendment rights on campus, and it takes the position, it, it defends many professors whom it believes uh, have had their First Amendment rights, First Amendment rights, it articulates it as First Amendment rights um, violated. So that's the way in which this conflict is framed, First Amendment rights versus um, whatever reasons universities have for regulating speech, protecting uh, fragile snowflake students or something like that. That tends to be the way this is formulated. So if that's really the formulation, we have to ask what we mean by First Amendment rights. What are First Amendment rights if these things are being um, violated? It may surprise you to know that there were no such thing as First Amendment rights until the 1930s. First Amendment is ratified in 1791, but at the time of its ratification, it really had no judicial meaning except prohibiting prior restraints. And protections for freedom of speech, as any one of you would recognize freedom of speech, doesn't exist till the 1930s. And uh, the reason for that shift is very complicated, but in a nutshell, it goes something like this. Um, Self-government in the United States was understood up until the end of the 19th century to be a matter of representation. You elected representatives and they spoke for you, and the mediating factor between you and your representatives since the 1830s was the political party. So self-government happened by choosing a party, and the party represented your interest at the seat of government. And then, at the end of the 19th century, with the, with the Gilded Age and the growth of the American economy, corporations began to be perceived as controlling political parties. Political parties were understood to be corrupt, as answerable to money and not to people. And so the whole movement of the progressive era was to um, say we want a direct aspect, a direct access to those who governed us. We, wanna, we don't want to have political parties there at all. 
So you have referenda and primaries and recalls, direct election of senators, you have direct primaries, you know all of this. And so the progressive era understood itself to be a democracy in which the government was unmediated by parties and directly responsive to me, to all of us. How does that happen? Well, the general theory that emerged, the sense of self-government in the United States that emerges in exactly the progressive era is you, you meaning the citizens, all of us, get to participate in the formation of public opinion. The government is responsive to public opinion, hence the government is responsive to you. So your freedom of speech, your freedom to participate in the formation of public opinion is what guarantees the United States as a democratic, self-governing nation because the state is responsive to the public opinion that you help form. And that um, formulation is the one that becomes increasingly um, to dominate as of the second decade of the 20th century. And um, uh, and a as a result of that formation, it began to be perceived as, for example, Learned Hand, who's one of the first judges ever to recognize the First Amendment right, wrote to Zachariah Chafee, who's the first academic ever to theorize protections for freedom of speech. He writes him a letter in which he says, any state which professes to be controlled by public opinion cannot take sides against any opinion except that which must express itself in the violation of law. On the contrary, it must regard all other expressions of opinion as tolerable if not good, because otherwise, if it stops me from expressing my opinion, it cuts me off from the good of democratic self-government, and that's the essence of America, that we govern ourselves. Now, this first finds its way into Supreme Court opinions in the famous November 1919 dissent by Oliver Wendell Holmes in Abrams versus United States. This is where the metaphor of marketplace of ideas comes from, and Holmes says that's an experiment, like all life is an experiment, but that's our experiment because of the First Amendment. Brandeis has a set of uh, basically dissenting opinions in the 20s, Whitney and Gilbert, in which he, uh, unlike Holmes, doesn't put it quite on the marketplace of ideas. He puts it on the requirements of democratic citizenship. He clearly gets that freedom of speech is about our governing ourselves, hence freedom of speech, he says, is the duty of the citizen. It's the duty of the state to allow citizens to express themselves so that the state can be responsive to its citizens, so that the First Amendment can be, in words that have come down to us over the ages, the First Amendment can be the guardian of our democracy. And when the First Amendment, when the Supreme Court first actually starts protecting First Amendment rights, which is in the 1930s, it adopts exactly this rationale for the protection of First Amendment rights. The first really important decision in that regard is 1931. It's a case called Stromberg versus California. And the court, as per Charles Evan Hughes, who was Chief Justice at the time, says, I'm quoting him, the maintenance of the opportunity for free political discussion to the end that government may be responsive to the will of the people and that changes may be obtained by lawful means, an opportunity essential to the security of the republic, is a fundamental principle of our constitutional system. This is revolutionary language in 1931. It sounds banal to you, but this is revolutionary in 1931. And then 10 years later, in a case which is one of my favorite cases, which probably most of you have never heard of, it's a case called Thornhill versus Alabama. It's by Justice Owen Roberts, and Roberts says, I'm quoting him now, those who won our independence had confidence in the power of free and fearless reasoning and communication of ideas to discover and spread political and economic truth. Noxious doctrines in those fields may be refuted and their evil averted by the courageous exercise of the right of free discussion. Abridgment of freedom of speech and of the press, however, impairs those opportunities for public education that are essential to effective exercise of the power of correcting error through the processes of popular government. So we have freedom of speech in order to have popular government, in a word, democracy, self-governance. And the court, to that end and for that purpose, not in the abstract, but to that end and for that purpose, began to develop doctrine, principles of First Amendment law. There are many, many, many principles of First Amendment law. Fred Schauer, the famous First Amendment scholar, has said the First Amendment is like the uh, tax code. You know, there's so many provisions, you can't begin to name them all, and they're all contradictory, blah, blah, blah. But I can pick three of them that are essential. If you don't see 
these three principles, you do not see a First Amendment problem. This is a basic common denominator of any First Amendment problem. I'm going to pick three. First one, no content discrimination. The state cannot regulate your speech based on its content, based on its viewpoint. It can't come in and say, you can talk about that, but not this. It can't say, you can take that point of view, but not this point of view. Can't do that. That's an essential principle of foundational principle of First Amendment doctrine. Second principle, this is coming out of the Holmes dissent in uh, Abrams, a famous marketplace of ideas theory. Namely, there's an equality of status of ideas for purposes of the First Amendment. Every idea is equal to every other. The court has put it this way. It says there's no such thing as a false idea for purposes of the First Amendment. The state can't come in and say, that's a bad idea, this is a good idea. Can't do that. All ideas are equal to every other idea. That's a basic First Amendment. The truth of the idea is to be determined in the marketplace. It gets it from Holmes. And third principle, the state can't make you talk. No compelled speech. So just as you have freedom to say what you want, you also have freedom to shut your mouth and not talk at all. The state can't make you talk if you don't want to talk. So this freedom from compelled speech, that's equally fundamental with no content discrimination and the equality of status of um, ideas. And these three rules, wherever you see a First Amendment problem, these three rules apply. And if they don't apply, you don't have a First Amendment problem in front of you. Now, these are very, very powerful rules. Um, they can't apply to all speech. So I, I just pick a, a simple example. You, know, you go to your lawyer, and your lawyer gives you an opinion. Words, right? Speaking to you, gives you an opinion, talks to you. Words, communication, speech. And terrible advice. Your lawyer gives you awful advice. And as a result, something bad happens to you. You're liable, something, you go to jail, something happens to you because your lawyer gave you bad advice. You sue your lawyer for malpractice. Can your lawyer turn around and say the First Amendment, no content discrimination? Um, my advice to you is an experiment. Is all life is an experiment? I don't think so. Can't do that. How about your doctor? Your doctor gives you a diagnosis, and as a result of your diagnosis, you don't have to worry about that. Turns out you got cancer, but you didn't treat it because your doctor said to you, words, said to you something which was wrong. Can you sue and say no? And the doctor says, no, you can't sue me for malpractice. I just talked to you, and no content, no, can't do that. Or somebody's cheating you on the internet, you know, says I'm sending you one thing and send you something else. Can they say no? No. I mean, most of our life, these rules don't apply. These are extreme rules. And why is that? Because they protect the capacity of citizens to be sovereign, to, um, to be um, autonomous in their direction of the state by forming the public opinion, which will direct the state. And these rules have particular purposes in that regard. So rule number one, no content discrimination. What's the purpose of that rule? Why do we have such a rule? Because it's up to public opinion to set the agenda for the state and not the state to set the agenda for public opinion. So the state can't say to the rest of us, I, I want to be dealing with this and not that. It's up to us to say, the state, you should be dealing with this and not that. And that's what the rule about content discrimination is about. It's like, who owns the upper hand for the setting of agenda for public opinion, the state or us? We do. We're sovereign. State isn't sovereign in a democracy. In a democracy, the people are sovereign, not the state. Right? The, the government is the servant of the people. In a monarchy, people are the subjects of the state. Here, it's opposite. What about the second rule? No such thing as a false idea. Well, epistemologically, that's nuts. Of course, there's good ideas and there's bad ideas. If you went around the world and you said, I can't tell the difference between good ideas and bad ideas, people would put you, lock you away. Because all of us have to know what's a good idea and what's a bad idea. We have to direct ourselves accordingly. So the claim of skepticism that you can never know what's a good idea, that can't be right. Instead, equality of ideas rests on political equality. We are all in a democracy politically equal vis-a-vis -vis the state. We each have an equal right to participate in public opinion formation and so direct the state. So political equality is some idea we understand. Epistemological equality is a recipe for a kind of skepticism and lunacy. And so that rule makes sense only where, actually, we have political equality, and political equality is a governing virtue, which is not most of our lives. Most of our lives, we do not live in a, in a realm in which we're politically equal. We live in unequal realms, like the relationship between you and your lawyer, or you and your doctor, or someone who's selling you a car, for example. Um, third rule, can't make you speak. 
well, if the point of First Amendment protections is so the government should be responsive to what I want, it's not responsive to I, what I want if the state is making me say something that I don't want to say, obviously, right? It's not responsive to my wishes if it's making me express things that I wouldn't otherwise express. So that rule perfectly um, realizes the value of autonomy. So these three rules define the citizen in the space of citizen autonomy, where the citizen is sovereign and directing the state. Now, once I've said that, then I've said something and should say something that you consider very paradoxical and very profound. Alexander Micklejohn, the great theorist of the First Amendment, says about democracy, it's a very strange form of government because the rulers are sometimes rulers and sometimes subjects. We make the rules to which we are bound. We are both subjects and rulers. Now, that means that if all of our speech were subject to these three rules, we could never be rulers. We could never have anything to rule because we would always be sovereign. There would be no one to rule if these three rules. So there must be the forms of speech to which these rules apply, which I'm going to call public discourse. Those are the forms of speech acts by which public opinion is constituted, and other forms of speech which we live our ordinary lives in the marketplace or with professionals or in any number, a million different circumstances. And one of those circumstances is being in the university. And so I'm going to come back now to the argument, the white hot controversy that we started. Remember, in the university, First Amendment rights are being denied, Sessions and DeVos, and just about everybody is saying First Amendment rights apply on the campus. So if what I just said were true, the answer to that puzzle would be pretty simple. Are we politically sovereign and equal in the university? Is that the function of a university to be democratic self-government? I don't think so. I think people are here to serve the mission of the university. The mission of the university is what? It's education, it's research, it's advancing knowledge. So that means that you would expect to see speech regulated in a university as necessary to serve the mission, the purposes of the, dis of the institution of a university. University is not a public space. It's not a public sphere. It's an institution with a mission. And we either accomplish that mission or we don't. And insofar as we're accomplishing it, we have to regulate the people in the institution and the speech of those people as necessary to accomplish the mission. So that's very abstract. Let's take very concretely and see whether these three rules, remember, unless you have these three rules, you do not have a First Amendment problem. So let's take these three rules in the classroom. So we have students, right, students in the classroom. Do these three rules apply to students in the classroom? No content discrimination? Mm, I don't think so, right? If I'm teaching a class in constitutional law, students better be talking about constitutional law in the classroom and not talking about the World Series, right? Of course there's content discrimination. Are um, all ideas equal in the classroom? You know what we call that? We call that grades. Of course there's better and worse ideas in the classroom because the whole point of the education is to empower students to know the difference between a good idea and a bad idea. Exactly opposite. It's not equal. Not all ideas equal in a classroom. The whole point of grades, the whole idea of education is to increase powers of discrimination so that students can discern the difference between good ideas and bad ideas. And if that were not true, the whole process by which we evaluate students and try to give them feedback and lead them to a better way would, couldn't get off the ground. What about um, compelled speech? Do we have compelled speech in the classroom? I should think so. You know what we call that? Yeah, you do. Examinations, right? I mean, you know, of course. I mean, you know, my job is to evaluate students. How can I evaluate the students unless they talk? I make them talk, or I couldn't know whether they did or didn't understand the material in the class. I couldn't teach a class unless I could make students respond to me in ways that violate the most basic principles of First Amendment law. So there's nothing like First Amendment rights of students in the classroom. What about the rights of a professor in the classroom? Do, do these three rules apply to me when I teach class? You bet not, right? If I'm hired uh, to teach constitutional law, I better be teaching constitutional law and not, you know, talking about Formula One racing. I can't do that and be hired to teach my class. What about, um, what about all ideas being equal? 
I don't think so. Right? If I'm teaching math and I get my equations wrong, I'm yanked out of the classroom because I'm not competent to teach the math. Right? If I think, if I teach my students that the First Amendment was ratified in 1868, I'm out of there, you know, because I'm not doing the job. I'm not competent to teach. Of course all ideas aren't equal when I'm teaching as a professor. And what about compelled speech in the classroom? I better, I better show up, and I better talk, and I better teach. Of course, of course you can do that. Public, university, private, doesn't matter. None of these rights, as we understand the most fundamental rules of first, have any application to either professors or students in the classroom. Now, does that mean that there's no freedom in the classroom? Well, there is something. There's something called academic freedom of teaching, which the AUP recognizes, Dartmouth recognizes, every self-respecting university and college recognizes that faculty have academic freedom of teaching in the classroom. What does academic freedom of teaching mean? Academic freedom of teaching in the classroom is actually quite broad, and it's the freedom to teach in such a way as to accomplish the mission of education of the university. So what's that mission? What do we do in a university? How do we, what's our, what are we trying to accomplish in a classroom? Well, part of it is information transmission. You should know the history. You should know when the First Amendment was actually ratified and so forth. But the real point of a college isn't the transmission of information, because you could get that on the internet. You could get that in a computer. The real point of higher education, for most universities, right? you can say all, but for most, and it depends on the particular university where you are, or particular college, um, the real point is to achieve what Cardinal Newman in the 19th century called a real cultivation of mind. And that means um, as, the university, as the American Association of University Professors put this in its classic statement of principles of academic freedom in 1915, which set out for the first time a statement of what academic freedom of teaching was, it says that the purpose of university education is not to provide students with ready-made conclusions, but to train them to think for themselves and to provide them access to those materials which they need if they are to think intelligently. So the object of higher education is to induce in students who are coming as they finish their late adolescence to induce in them a mature independence of mind. That's really the object of um, higher education. And how do you do that? So independence of mind is not information which I can hand to students. It can't be given to you by a machine. The best theory that we have of how to induce a mature independence of mind is to enact independence of mind before the students, is to give them a role model in which somebody is at the front of the class being independent and showing what it means actually to think through a problem and wrestle it to the ground. And hopefully students see what that's like and want to emulate it. Richard Rorty, the philosopher, puts it like this. He says, students need to have freedom enacted before their eyes by actual human beings if higher education is to achieve its purpose of becoming a provocation to self-creation. You need a kind of cathexis. And how professors do that is very much a matter of the individual professor, but that's the object. So academic freedom of teaching is typically understood to be quite broad, but it is not First Amendment freedom of speech. It has totally different properties. Because as a teacher, I am always assessed on my competence as a teacher. And the First Amendment prohibits anyone from being assessed on the basis of competence. So the whole logic is an entirely different logic. The purpose of First Amendment rights is to enable self-governance. The purpose of academic freedom of teaching is to enable education. So they follow completely different logics. And it's only confusion to say, gosh, you don't have First Amendment rights in the university. Of course you don't have First Amendment rights in the classroom in the university because you're not trying to do the thing which First Amendment rights are trying to help you do. Now, I've talked about the classroom. That's a little exceptional. Um, we could also, I mean, let me just, just pick one other point in the classroom. So in the area of First Amendment jurisprudence generally, the United States is very exceptional. You might know we, we don't permit the regulation of racist speech. So people can say whatever insulting, abusive, degrading, humiliating, uh, disgusting thing they want to say, and the First Amendment protects them from state regulation. This is quite unusual in the world, but it's our way. But even that having been said, there is no competent professor that I know of that allows such speech in a classroom. 
Right? And in fact, our professional responsibility, uh, the ethics of code of professors, which almost every professor is obliged to follow in every university that I know of, requires us to demonstrate respect for students as individuals and adhere to their proper roles as intellectual guides and counselors. It requires us to avoid any exploitation, harassment, or discriminatory treatment of students. None of this would apply to speech outside in the park. And yet all of it applies to speech in the classroom. It applies student to student speech. No student in my classrooms can call another student a name. But in the park, people call each other names all the time under the First Amendment, and you can't regulate it. Why is that? Because you can't be educated if you're calling each other names. You can't be educated unless people are showing respect for each other in the university. Education and respect go together. You can't have a mature independence of mind if you're not respected. As a person, we're talking about as a person. And so we have different rules in the classroom because these rules are required in order to achieve the purpose of the classroom. And totally different than what happens in a park because the classroom isn't a park. It's a totally different place. Let me now um, take another shot at this. Let's look at my role as a professor, as a researcher, right? I just talked about teaching. The role of the mission of the university is to teach. But the university has another major mission which is to advance knowledge, to increase the amount of knowledge in the world. This is a, an important um, uh, purpose of modern American universities. It comes into place after the Civil War. John Hopkins is the first American university to take that as its uh, self-conscious mission. Before the Civil War, American universities, uh, if they were universities, the object was to create good Christian gentlemen with good Christian character, which is different than advancing knowledge. You know, totally different aim an educational aim of a certain kind, not mature independence of mind, but good Christian morality and character. Um, we now, modern university, our job is to find out something new about the world. And um, people often say, well, as to that, certainly you have First Amendment rights. And why do people think that? They think that because you've heard so often that the marketplace of ideas is the only way to get at truth. And so unless you have the freedom of the marketplace of ideas, you're not going to advance knowledge. And what I'm going to suggest to you now is a little, um, let's put it this way, it's a little thought provoking. What I'm going to say to you is there is no site in American culture which actually advances knowledge, which functions according to the marketplace of ideas. They all function any place that's advancing knowledge as distinct from I want opinion, I want to say this or I want to say that. But knowledge does so by enforcing disciplinary standards. So any of you ever edited or submitted a journal, an article to a disciplinary journal, a professional journal, they don't have a marketplace of ideas. They make judgments, better and worse. And the kind of knowledge which universities are there to increase is not like immediate sensory knowledge. I know that I'm in a lecture room and I'm talking to you because I see it. It's not that kind of knowledge. It's not the kind of knowledge that's charismatic that, say, art might um, increase. It's rather what we call um, disciplinary knowledge. So if I want to know what the half-life is of plutonium-230, I can't look at it. I have to know, the, I have to know uh, physics right? or chemistry. Or if I want to know whether nicotine causes cancer, I can't smoke a cigarette and find that out. I need to have the disciplinary knowledge of medicine. Right? Everything that the university does as by way of knowledge production is done by way of these disciplinary structures, which are very complicated structures. They tend to be housed in university departments. They tend to also to transcend particular universities by having national organizations like the American Historical Society or the MLA or the American Philosophical Association, um, that sort of thing. Um, but we need this disciplinary knowledge in order to function as a modern society. We need engineers to build bridges. We need doctors to get us a vaccine against Zika. Um, we need to have literary scholars to tell us you know, whether Shakespeare authored Shakespeare or whether it was uh, Francis Bacon or what the meaning we want to extract from Milton is, that sort of thing. Um, and what is a discipline then? Um, disciplines are defined by Thomas Haskell, I think, well, as the communities of the competent. Disciplines are a, a community of inquiry of people who have been trained to know what the disciplinary practices are. So, in the freedom of speech, we postulate democratic equality. Everyone is equal to everyone else. That is not true in a discipline. There are people who are qualified and people who are unqualified. That's why to become a member of a discipline, you have to undergo a rigorous training. We call it graduate school, where you are apprenticed and your competence is certified. Once you are 
competent, then you are part of this community of the competent, and your judgments rise or fall with their persuasive quality. But you don't get to exercise judgment in a discipline. You don't get to be somebody on the internet and then suddenly say, you know, it turns out that um, the sun goes around the earth. The astronomers are not going to listen to you because you don't know the rules of evidence and reasoning of astronomy. And you have to know those things in order to make a point that is convincing within a discipline. Now, so disciplines have authority. That authority is exercised in many ways. Universities are unique in the production of disciplinary knowledge. Knowledge is produced in our society in many locations. It's produced in corporations. It's produced in Bell Labs. It's produced all over the place. But only one place, only one institution, creates and nourishes disciplines, quad disciplines, and that's the university. We define what a discipline is. We define who's in the discipline and not in the discipline by who we give a degree to and who not, and who we teach and who we don't teach as we instruct people in the disciplines. That's the job of the university. It's the only institution which does that, replenishes, refurbishes, keeps the discipline alive. Now, a discipline's job is to know what, they're, what we know, to keep alive the practices of knowing, but Disciplines can't discover new knowledge, which we want disciplines to do, unless you're free to critique old knowledge. So all disciplines have built into them the need for freedom of inquiry. And Thomas Haskell puts it this way. He says, the price of participation in the community of the competent is perpetual exposure to criticism. So if you're going to be in a discipline, if you're going to be a philosopher or a law professor, everybody gets to take pot shots at you. Who's in the discipline? They all get to criticize you, and you have to answer them. And that's part of what it means to be in the discipline. But this freedom of inquiry is quite different than First Amendment rights. Because in the land of First Amendment, there's no final judgment about what's right, what's wrong, who gets to publish, and who doesn't get to publish. Whereas in disciplines, there is a balance between, on the one hand, freedom of inquiry, and on the other hand, a judgment about whether the criticism is successful or not successful. And disciplines exist in that tension which does not exist in the land of First Amendment rights, because in First Amendment rights, everyone is equal to everyone else, and it's an ongoing, never-ending process of political self-governance. Disciplines are, we have to act on this. We either know it or we don't. There's either global warming or there isn't, and we are making these judgments, and we're acting on the basis of the judgment that we have uh, made. Now, how does that cash out in the university's regulation of me, of a professor, as a researcher, as someone who's making new knowledge. How does it do that? Do First Amendment rules apply? Well, I've suggested to you they wouldn't. Now think about it, forget everything I just said, think about it in the most common sense way. You know what the First Amendment means, right? Because I've given you the three essential rules that would define any First Amendment situation. Is there content discrimination vis-a-vis -vis me as a faculty member in research? Of course there is. We hire people whose research we think is promising. We hire in fields we think are worthy of research, and so forth and so on. How about all ideas being equal in the area of research? I don't think so, right? I mean, if I'm denying the Holocaust, I'm not getting tenure, right? Because my competence as a researcher is perennially subject to evaluation and criticism. This is not permissible under the First Amendment, but it's how universities function. And if they couldn't function that way, they couldn't advance research, because that's the way disciplines function. They make judgments, unlike the area of the First Amendment, where everything is always um, open. And what about compelled speech? Do you know what we call that? Any untenured people in the room? <laughs> we call that publish or perish, right? I mean, of course there's compelled speech. We're hiring you because you're a competent researcher. Show us you're a competent researcher. I can't make you talk in the First Amendment world, but I sure can make you talk before I give you tenure. Um, at a university, and that's not a problem. That's not a problem in a public university. It's not a problem in a private university. It's not a problem if you're going to have a university at all. Right? So of course the First Amendment doesn't apply in the university. There's no way that First Amendments apply, First Amendment rights apply in, to the university. So what the heck is this, con is, this, is this controversy about then? Why is it that people like Sessions say universities can't be discriminating on the basis of content? Uh, we discriminate based every single day in every way with respect to almost every student and every faculty member. So what is this controversy about then? I mean, it's about an abstract formal concept of First Amendment rights which fails to understand that those rights are defined for a certain reason. That reason is self-governance. And the minute you see that, then you know, of course, of course, 
you know, I could have had a V8. Of course, First Amendment rights don't apply in the university because it's not about self-governance. It's not about sovereign self-determination. It's about advancing knowledge and educating, which is a totally different task. So education is uh, the speech in the university to be regulated according to completely different rules. So what might be giving rise to this controversy? I mean, apart from the partisanship of it all, which is a big question, but I'll put that to one side. Um, I think that some of this controversy arises in the context of outside speakers to the university who are coming to the university, and really their function within the university is not clear. So we don't think of outside speakers the way we think of tenured or uh, line faculty as having instruments of the university to accomplish its mission. We don't think of them as students. Um, we, they have a complicated and ill-defined relationship to the central mission of the university. And so we might think of them as like speakers whose First Amendment rights need to be protected. So maybe that's the picture that's causing the confusion here. We're thinking only of a very narrow little class of cases peripheral to the central mission of the university, outside speakers, and we're saying their rights should be um, protected. Now, sometimes their rights um, have to do with uh, um, academic freedom. So I have academic freedom of research and of teaching. Let's say I want to bring in an outside speaker and I want to say um, this speaker is necessary to educate my students and the administration says to me, no, you can't have that speaker because that speaker is unacceptable. Our trustees will be angry if you have that speaker. Then it's between me, the faculty member, and the administration. My academic freedom of teaching or research will, uh, will, should give the palm to me. I should, my judgment should control over, and that's a, over the administration. So that's a question of academic freedom. And it's relatively simple to analyze and solve. So we have a more difficult problem, and a lot of these cases arise in a more difficult posture, which is a student organization invites a speaker. Now, a student organization doesn't have academic freedom. Student organizations have the resources to invite speakers because universities choose to give them the resources. But why does a university choose to give student organizations the resources to invite speakers? Right? Why? Is a student like a park where anyone gets to talk? No. People get to come on a university. Why? If university resources are being spent on a speaker, it's because the speaker is serving the purposes of the university, those purposes being either education or research. And if a speaker isn't serving those purposes, then the university is wasting its resources. It should be subject to suit because it's spending its resources on things that have nothing to do with its mission or its purpose. So anytime a university spends its resources on a speaker, it must be because that speaker is serving the purposes of the university. So a student organization is authorized, we give, a, a university gives to student organizations the authority independently to ask a speaker because the university thinks that the, um, the uh, students will serve educational purposes by making an independent judgment about inviting a speaker. It's an educational judgment on the part of the university. And when the students exercise that judgment, are they thinking of First Amendment rights? Do they say anyone has a right to come to talk to my organization? It's just random who comes to talk to my organization. Do they say that? I don't think so. I, I think when a student organization invites a speaker, they invite the speaker because they think the speaker is something worthwhile to say. Right? That's why you would invite a speaker if you were a student organization. You think you have something to learn from this person. Well, if that's true, what do people mean when they say content discrimination shouldn't apply? Of course it applies. It applies for the reason that the students are asking that speaker precisely because they're exercising the educational judgment that that speaker has something important to say to us. That's content discrimination. That's viewpoint discrimination. That's not all ideas being equal. That's not a marketplace of ideas. It's none of those things. It's students exercising their determination of what's educationally to their benefit. And that's perfectly proper. That's how it should work. But then what are we talking about in those circumstances by saying this is a First Amendment problem? As if the speaker had a right. I can't walk up to a university and say, invite me, it's my First Amendment right. Of course I can't say that. No one thinks that. So what are we talking about when we're talking about the First Even in this limited circumstance, what we're talking about is the educational purpose served by giving students the right to determine in their own way and for their own reasons what's to their educational benefit. So that's the crucial question. That's, again, not a question of First Amendment right. That's a question of what serves the educational mission of the university. And I think a lot of this problem is the universities have lost track of their purposive nature. They've lost track of 
why they allow students to spend university resources to invite speakers, and the ways in which delegating that authority to a student organization does or does not serve the educational functions of the university. That's a serious question that universities should debate and have. That's an entirely different question than the First Amendment rights being violated of speakers who have no First Amendment right to come onto a university. It's not a park. It's not Hyde Park. It's not anyone gets to come and talk and say whatever they want. So that's the framework in which this has to be understood. So notice the fundamental move I've said. What I've done here is what I promised you to say. I promised you I would give you a purpose of account of rights. When you see people say First Amendment rights are violated, rights in that sentence are very abstract. They're very formal and they have no connection. They're not tied to any reason. And of course they can be used to argue anything, but the minute you think about it for two seconds, you know that argument makes no sense at all because they haven't thought about the reasons for the right in the first place and why that right can't apply to this situation. Really, in this situation, we have a different dialogue, not an easy dialogue, a difficult dialogue, but an important dialogue that all parties can have, which is, what are we doing here? What's our purpose in being in a university together, and what do we want to accomplish by our education here? So that's where I'll leave it. We'll go to questions. Hi. Uh, yeah. So, my you talk a lot about purposes of universities. I was wondering who gets to adjudicate that sort of purpose. So, if I, as an individual student, think, "Let's bring Trump to campus," I think it's great for my education. Does the student body, if they don't, dis if they disagree, is the ex university accountable to me, to the student body, to the trustees, to the faculty? Um, who gets to adjudicate whether the university has fulfilled its purpose of like getting the best education? Um, well, that's a question of governance within the university. I think the larger point is a university itself has a function, which is education. And we need, under, we need a common understanding of what that is. And not all universities have the same one. Right? I'm on the so-called Committee A of the AAUP, American Association of University. So we see alleged violations of academic freedom all over the country. And I see lots of little college, like Lutheran colleges in Nebraska. And their purpose is not what I've described to you, to educate. They want to create good Christian persons, again, you know, like, like uh, 1848. And um, they have a, a right to do that. I mean, that's what their educational mission is, as defined, self-conscious. And so the first thing is, what do we want to achieve? Do we want to achieve a mature independence of mind? That's the first question. If that's the case, then the next question is, who, um, to whom is delegated the authority to make the decision about the allocation of university resources? Universities didn't used to give student organizations the right to ask speakers to campus. So if I'm asking, if I, the university, I'm actually the university, actually the university, and I'm inviting a speaker to graduation, I'm endorsing that speaker. But what I do now, since the 1960s, is I've delegated decisions about who gets to come to campus and spend university with two different student organizations. That's not a given. That was an educational decision that most modern universities made. Why did they make that? Why did they delegate the independent judgment to students? Is it because they, belt, they, they understood that students would have a better idea of expertise that they needed than faculty? Is it because they wanted to create on campus a climate of diverse opinion that would mirror the diverse opinion in a democracy and so train students to become democratic citizens? I mean, there's a variety of ways to do that. But the question really goes to the policy and not the particular speaker. Although it could be the case that the particular speaker has such a negative impact that it overrides the policy. That, I don't want to rule that out. That's possible. But then we're talking education against education and with a common understanding of what education is. And also, I want to say, even for an outside speaker, these rules of civility that I'm describing to you have to hold. Because no more would I allow a student to insult another student in a class or a faculty can't insult. An outside speaker can't do that. So what's his name, Milo, what's his, I always forget his name. Milo what? Yiannopoulos, right. So he went to Berkeley and he gave a talk and one of the things he did is he had the camera single out transgender students and show them, hold them up to ridicule on the screens. You don't get to do that, right? I mean, I don't care whether you're an outside speaker or a faculty member or anything. You don't get to do that because education can't happen in a realm of incivility. Now, 
uh, I'm making a very sharp distinction here between incivility and ideas. We may not like ideas, but ideas themselves can be expressed in a civil way, and then we debate ideas, and if we mean by mature independence of mind the ability to evaluate ideas we don't like, which in a democracy we're all gonna have to do because we have to live cheek by jowl with all sorts of people we're not gonna like, um, then it's a different question. You know, we have to distinguish those sorts of things. In a university, we can insist on rules of respect because we're insisting on education. But if we're insisting on education to mean the ability to evaluate any idea, then we have to distinguish between those two things. So you're talking about this like relationship between incivility and these ideas and depending on the deliverance and like this kind of code of conduct or standard that the university holds for mm -hmm. how these ideas are delivered seems to also suggest that there are like inherent ideas that aren't harmful and violent in and of themselves. Like if Milo Yiannopoulos was completely like a well-to-do, like nice dude and just was saying like very transphobic things, I still think that does a kind of violence that like I don't think... I, I don't know what the standard would be then, like at that point, if it's still doing the kind of violence that, like, uh, the code. Well, one has to be therefore quite, uh, careful about words like violence, right? Um, violence can mean I experience it, the idea as an assault. I don't like that idea. It threatens my identity. Or it could mean actually someone's, um, it could mean actually physical, it could mean a lot of things. And the question of how we define violence is a question of our purpose. And if our purpose is to be able to encounter and master any idea, then we don't define violence as the presence of an idea that is otherwise stated in a civil way. Now, this distinction I'm making between the content and manner of speech, it's a very controversial distinction. It's made in the law of many countries, like Great Britain. It's not made in our First Amendment law. So in our First Amendment law, you can't distinguish between what someone is saying and how they say it. Because, we, because the First Amendment says some things you can only say in an uh, uh, outrageous way, because that expresses the intensity of your feeling. And underlying this is a debate about what language is. Some people view language as thick. That is to say, you can only, the language cannot be translated. How you say it and what you say are inseparably distinguished. Like Shelley, the poet Shelley said, you can never translate a poem. And that's the reason for it, because the exact form of expression and what you say, same thing. Other people say language is transparent to the ideas in language, and therefore you can make this distinction that I'm making. I actually think that language is thick myself, and that's one reason why out there in the park you can't distinguish what someone is saying from how they're saying it. But in a university, we can make that distinction. Why is that? Because we have a community which tells us um, what forms of respect are necessary for us to deal with each other. And that's gonna be defined by our purpose. And if our purpose is to master ideas, to go back, then it's gonna separate ideas from this, even though logically, I fully agree with you, you can't. On the other hand, if our purpose is I want to just explore some ideas rather than others, so it's not a mature independence of mind, meaning mature being able to face everything that's outside the walls, then I'll have a different definition of what's violent and what not violent within these walls. So it all depends on what you mean by education. I come back to a purposive definition of both education and the speech that is necessary to achieve that purpose. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this really interesting talk. I, I agree with uh, most uh, or many of your conclusions, but I'm not persuaded by the argument that the First Amendment doesn't have an important place on college campuses, and not to run through all of the three elements of those principles, but just take the third one, for example, which you mentioned, namely that the idea that there's no compelled speech is false and inapplicable to college campuses. One of the two branches there concerns in-classroom stuff, not researching stuff. And there you say, OK, the professor is under a kind of duty to teach and to say things. If he or she showed up and never spoke, then they'd you know, face consequences. And similarly, for students, uh, they're required to convey their speech either in writing or in in-class uh, conversation and so on. So here are the two problems I see with that. The first is a kind of compulsion problem which goes like this, you might say, well, sure, you know, the professor or the student is under a kind of compulsion to do these things or if they face some consequence. The professor might be terminated. The student might fail uh, the course. But that's different in kind from, for example, being fined 
by the government, let's say, for not teaching or for not submitting your exam. It's certainly different from being incarcerated for doing neither of those things. Um, and so it looks like the kind of compulsion is different. And the second problem is the agent that produces the compulsion here, it's the college or the university, is different from, say, the government coming and saying, listen, you have to convey these ideas in class or else you're going to be fined or imprisoned or some such. I can't recall off the, uh, offhand what the New Hampshire case was for the... Uh, Sweeney. The other one with the courier of government message, Barnett or some such. Oh, you mean West Virginia? Barnett versus West Virginia? Maybe it the was Sweeney then. The absolute case? This or you is mean the, Sweeney? The this is the one... Visiting lecture at the University of New Hampshire. That's right. The one who, the person who didn't want to have live free or die on the yeah. license plate. Yeah, that's Willie versus Maynard. Maynard, okay. And so... Um, and so there, the court says, look, you can't be forced to be a courier of government's yes. ideological message. Yes. And so similarly, couldn't we say if the government tried to say, as a professor, you must convey these ideas in class or you're going to face punishment, that that would be impermissible and certainly looks like a First Amendment violation and certainly looks, therefore, as though the First Amendment definitely does apply to in-classroom kinds of situations, not to mention the other kinds of situations. Yeah, so those are two good questions. Um, the first on the sanction one is relatively easy to answer. Namely, it doesn't matter if you're fired versus paying a $10 fine, I'd rather pay the $10 fine. So the question of what the sanction is in First Amendment law, that doesn't make any difference. That you are sanctioned is enough. Even if you're chilled in what you want to say is enough. So that wouldn't distinguish what's going on here. Now, your question of can the government compel speech in the university? The answer is um, what we think of as the university uh, of academic freedom is the autonomy of the university from government control, precisely that. So the government can't tell the university or shouldn't be able to tell. We, this is actually a very ill-formed part of constitutional law. We have many different cases going in many different directions, but one theme that one can extract from the cases is that academic freedom, insofar as it's a constitutional concept, preserves the autonomy of the university from government compulsion, precisely because we want to separate the sphere of knowledge creation from the sphere of power. If the government can create knowledge and at the same time have power, then our independence as citizen is compromised. So the, uh, the university can compel your speech because the university is the, um, is the site at which the disciplines function. But of course, the university can breach that. It can make you say things which perhaps it shouldn't. And the protection we have against the university is academic freedom of teaching or academic freedom of research. Now, um, I should have said a few words about academic freedom of research, but the interesting thing about that is you and I, as professors, if you're prof is have academic freedom of research. That is not a First Amendment right to say what we want. So I'm talking, I say the moon is made of green cheese and I don't get tenure in the astronomy department. You don't get tenure in the astronomy department. Now, let's say I'm a young professor and I don't get tenure and I'm angry and I think they've judged me for political reasons or inappropriate reasons and I sue and I go to court and I say they've made an inappropriate judgment, they've judged on the wrong criteria, how is a court going to decide that case? It's going to decide that case by calling experts to determine whether your work merited tenure. Namely, it's going to enforce the standards of the discipline. And if it did, then it may go against the university. And if it didn't, then it'd support the university. What does that mean? That the law here is and should be supporting the standards of the discipline not the university understood as an administrative entity, but the standards of the discipline because the function is the protection of the autonomy of the discipline. And that's why the AAUP 1915 declaration says academic freedom does not apply to the individual speech of the professor, because you could be saying the moon is made of blue cheese and then you suffer. Rather, it applies to the independence of the profession. The profession gets to apply professional standards to the evaluation of professionals. Professionals, professors can't be evaluated by religious standards or by the standards of the trustees and the public or by the standards of big donors or anything like that. We only get to be uh, evaluated by reference to the standards of the profession. That's what academic freedom means. And that's when it's going to define the appropriate form of compulsion and the inappropriate form of compulsion. Now, I don't want to say compulsion has nothing to do with anything, but it's going to be defined in that purposive way, which is a different purpose than First Amendment rights. 
So every time we say that the state is restricted from doing something, we are not saying, that has to do with communication, we are not saying First Amendment. And it's that move that I'm objecting to. Um, I had a question about, uh, so listening to you. Yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Listening to you, uh, it felt like the rules are applied where you are sort of geographically based. Basically, if you're in the university, there are good ideas and bad ideas. And if you're in the park, it's not the case. So I'm just curious about discussions in the park that are discipline-based, like you're having a discussion of economics. And of course, there are good ideas and bad ideas that are validated. But do those rules still apply in the park or no? Yeah, outside the government's, outside the university sphere. Well, what would you mean to say it's applying? Right? I'm an economist and I'm saying, actually a trade war is gonna help us, right? Which would get you instantly fired from any economic department. And what do you mean by enforced? You mean you don't have to hire that person? Yes, you don't have to hire that person. And if that person's outside um, uh, speaking shows that they're incompetent as a professor, that could be grounds for revoking tenure. No, my question was more as a general. So if I'm, if there are two people who are talking outside uh, the university campus, talking about the same thing. Then the First Amendment rules would typically apply, and the state, all your ideas are equal because you're politically equal. You're trying to form public opinion. We should have a trade war. The state can't come in and say, actually, you know, within public opinion formation, there are experts, and their view counts more than yours. As Rawls would say, in the public sphere, there are no experts. We're all equal democratic citizens, and therefore, the state doesn't get to enforce standards of professional discipline on public opinion formation. So there is this separation between the political and the knowledge formation sphere. So the same, if the same discussion happens in a university, that means you can sort of say that, no, the trade war is bad or good. Everything depends on context, right? If we're talking about a university and what a university does to serve its purposes, that's one thing. If we're talking about citizens trying to form public policy, that's another thing. And how to make these relationships, that's a third thing, which is a very difficult, tricky question. Um, I was... Oh, sorry. I was just wondering, like, I was interested that you didn't draw any distinction between um, placing restrictions on speech versus content um, of the conclusion and standards by which the conclusion is reached. Because I think a lot of people, when they complain about these supposed freedom of speech allegations, they sort of understand that there's some restrictions on content to the extent that there are disciplinary standards for how you have to make an argument in the science department. You have to present certain evidence face that, but people are often objecting to the fact that it seems like in some cases the exact same standards are being upheld, but um, speakers are being shut down simply because of the political connections of their conclusions. Like you might have a pro-life speaker and a pro-choice speaker that both use the exact same style of argumentation. They both have the same education level. They're following the same rules but a college who pretends to say we want a mature development of mind and doesn't have a specific Christian purpose is saying that one of these speakers isn't allowed and the other one is. Yeah, well, the question is what's the university policy? If the university policy is to delegate to student groups and they should learn from their autonomous choices, then the university has an obligation to follow its own policy and is violating its own policy by not respecting, I mean, the difference in political opinion is irrelevant to the educational purpose by hypothesis that we've served. Now, it could be that in any given case, like this speaker is gonna cost $2 million in security, that's a different question, we're not talking about that. We're talking now, the hypothesis you put on the table is pure political views. That would seem to me contrary to the very reason why you're delegating the decision. And then you, as a university, need to account for me as well, why you're making those distinctions. You seem actually not to be making those distinctions. Um, you seem to be saying one side gets to be autonomous and not the other, that's a problem. Right? It's not a problem if, on the other hand, you say this speaker is so um, uh, contrary to the educational uh, purpose of the university that we can't really give the facilities of the university to it. So I remember once I was at Berkeley and David Irving, you know who he is? He's a Holocaust denier. And he was invited by some group. It was supported by outside money. And my own view of it was, if, you're gonna, if, if we've given the students the power to do it, do it, but don't show up at the event. Because you shouldn't give him the, the privilege of an audience, because he's shown that he's not a serious person. 
and therefore he has nothing education to contribute to a university. That's different from saying you can't show it at all. Now, in response to that, some people say, well, when a speaker uses a university platform, the university is endorsing them. I don't think the university is endorsing it if the policy is students get to make their own decisions. So university has lots of books in its libraries. Right? Does it endorse the content of every book in its library? No, because the policy is to acquire every book that's relevant to whatever educational function is the library acquisition policy is. And the same would be true by hypothesis of speaker acquisition policies. Um, if the university were responsible for what I, as a faculty member, published, it would be responsible for lots of different contradictory things. And it would be contrary to academic freedom to hold the university responsible for what I'm doing. We need that separation for me to be free to publish what I'm going to publish. Otherwise, the university would be held accountable. Same would be true on certain accounts for certain kinds of outside speakers, not, say, for graduation speakers. Does the First Amendment apply if a person is just publishing something like in a popular press? Like well, first, apply to whom and in what context, you see. I mean, if, uh, if, if the state is going to publish someone for publishing in Sports Illustrated, yes, it applies. Even if the person is a professor. A um, president of a state university finds out that Charles Murray is coming to speak, and he determines that the bell curve, in his judgment, is racist and he cancels the invitation. And not only that, he says, this is a racist book. We want to clean the library out of these books. And we're going to make a big pile in front of the library, and we're going to burn every book that supports this kind of racist idea. No First Amendment problem there? No, no First Amendment problem, but a real educational problem. I mean, that university president has just said, you know what? There's no independence of mine here, because I've decided for you what you're going to hear and not hear, and what you're going to read and not read. And you can't go outside my dictates. That's what that university president just said. I don't know what an education would be in that circumstance. You know, That's a form of indoctrination, not of education, as I define education. On the other hand, if this person were the president of a Lutheran university in Nebraska, he may well have that right and people would accept it because that's what they've gone to that place to do. So this is part of what the commitment is of the institution in terms of what they promise to achieve for their students. It just seems to me, again, a number of us have asked the same question. It's about definitions. What is racism? How can you define the limits of what racism, racism is or isn't and then put that into policy as, a, as, a, well, as an you can You can put it into policies in terms of the respect that every student should, in, should have. You can put it into policies about who's a student and who's not a student in terms of affirmative. There's a lot of things you can do with respect to combating racism. But if you're imagining that you combat racism by saying certain ideas are off limits and you can't even think about them, even to reject them, in the million sense of you're actually stronger if you see what that idea is and know why you're rejecting it, then my view is you've, you've repudiated the basic premise of a university education. But that's, you know, if, if you want to do that, then you have to tell me what your premise of education is, you know, what you're there to do. Well, what we've seen in universities is repudiation of arguments against affirmative action, and repudiation of arguments against uh, measuring IQ by different races, things like that. You have to specify more what you're talking about. Well, I mean, affirmative action, people who argue against affirmative action yeah. policies of universities yeah. are shouted down as being racist. Yeah. Again, this, this definition of racism is so broad. Well, of course. That's the point about the conflict of ideas there. That's why we need to have people think about it and understand what the different views are, precisely because it's a controversial issue, precisely because half the country thinks one way and the other half thinks a different way. This is where you need an education. This is where you need to educate people to think for themselves carefully and critically about these questions. And that's why a college president who did what you're describing would be doing something terrible. But not according to the First Amendment. Well, let me, let me, be, let me say something. Um, a little more complicated than I've said, um, not according to the First Amendment that you see the people I quoted talking about, because that First Amendment is no content discrimination, no viewpoint discrimination. Myself, it is the case that the First Amendment applies to public universities because First Amendment applies everywhere. But what First Amendment applies? The First Amendment applies that allows the institution to perform its function. So underlying the application of the First Amendment to a university is an understanding of what the function is of a university. 
And that's how that case would be litigated and understood. That's a little more sophisticated, but it will come down exactly to what I've described, namely what are the principles of academic freedom there? What is the function of the university and is the action consistent or inconsistent with that function? That is totally um, uh, at odds with the idea of no content discrimination. It's totally idea, uh, at odds with the idea of no compelled speech. It's totally uh, at odds with the idea of every idea being equal. But it does require importing into constitutional law, which I think you can find in various places, the idea that universities have a constitutional function that requires protection. And when the university administrators act in ways that are inconsistent with that function, we may have a constitutional problem. That goes back to your question of whether we can have an idea of academic freedom that is constitutional. This is very um, abstruse stuff, very hypothetical stuff, but one can make those arguments. There's nothing like that kind of clarity in the court's opinion. And when you see the rhetoric of these conflicts, it's not posed that way. What's posed is, individual First Amendment rights of freedom of speech versus um, every education. That can't be the conflict. The conflict is one within what educational purposes are that are independent of state control. Hi. <laughs> Over here. Oh, <laughs> Hello. Sorry. Um, you mentioned a lot that the First Amendment doesn't apply in the classroom when it's contrary to the purpose of the educational institution. Um, but I'm curious on what your opinion is on the restriction of the First Amendment in other forums in universities that still serve that educational purpose but are maybe less formal. So say like uh, student-run newspapers or like interpersonal relations among students. So like can a student be expelled or punished by the university for racist rhetoric or um, prejudiced rhetoric that's published by a student newspaper or that's said to another student and the other student can provide evidence of that. Yeah, so um, in, the in the control of student newspapers, we have an interesting problem because presumably student newspapers exist to educate students in the virtues of journalism. And that means the educational function is to uh, respect and inculcate the values of independence we attribute to the press. And the university has to respect those if it's going to teach the virtue of student journalism. So that's a very special case that's different, say, than a classroom. We want you know, your student editors to be fighting you if you're the publisher, like that sort of thing. Now, student-on-student student student speech, mm -hmm. this is the equivalent, I would say, of private speech. And um, I think students, as members of a university community, have the obligations of being a community member. And there's forms of actions which are consistent and inconsistent with being a member of the community. If you act certain ways towards your fellow members of the community, they are inconsistent with an education, an inclusive education for everyone there. The university is perfectly justified in saying you can no longer be a member of a community because the obligation of the community is what's primary. It's what's defining the community itself. Now, when you postulate the particular case of a, of a student publishing something in a newspaper, that's a more complicated question. I'm not sure how I think about it because mm -hmm. that's equivalent to the student going to the public sphere. So on the one hand, it's more damaging. On the other hand, you're, it's an exchange of ideas. If it's an exchange of ideas, if it's like uh, a set of insults, then it's a different thing in the, way, in the distinction I was drawing. So one would have to be kind of careful in how one analyzed that problem, and it contains many different conflicting principles. It's a good question. Thank you. Thanks. Do you make a distinction between public and private universities? And I can think of an example that might illustrate the case. Um, Attorney General Sessions just had the Justice Department join a free speech case Harvard. at a public university involving the free speech zone um, where the university had declared that you can only speak freely in the designated place on campus. And that doesn't seem to meet the three criteria that you put out, that it doesn't seem to rise to the level of a free speech issue. It, would it be okay for a public university to say the only place you can speak freely on campus is in this 10 square foot area that we well, I, I don't even know what, I mean, you know, there's a lot of the stuff about free speech zones. I don't even know what that means. You know, I mean, what are they doing in a classroom or in the student newspaper or in a variety of places in the, when they write a paper, except in some sense speaking freely and not in another sense speaking freely. So when you see the free speech zone, what does it mean? It means you can say anything, you can hurl racist insults, and they're like, no. 
Even if you're in that zone, you shouldn't be able to do it if you're in the purview of the university. Does it, what, what exactly can you do there that you wouldn't do um, elsewhere? I'm, I don't even get the formulation of the problem. And I, I, I'm taking this intervention by session. It's not to say a court won't fine for him, but a court say, you know, the court will say First Amendment applies to public universities as if they did. And then it wouldn't think through all the examples that we just talked about in the regulation, everyday regulation of speech in university. So one thing is um, courts will say the darndest things. That's another way to think about this problem. But I don't know what, what when, a, when a university says that, what it even means. I mean, what is it permitting there that it wouldn't permit elsewhere? You mean a hold a rally, you mean like get up on a soapbox? Well, then that's fair enough. I mean, most universities say that. They say you can't hold a public rally in the classroom and in the administration building. And they say this is the place that it makes sense, in Sproul Plaza or wherever it is that's appropriate for a, a rally. I mean, most universities have rules about that, and that's not a problem. You wouldn't call that a free speech zone. I mean, a million places in the university you can't hold a public rally because you couldn't have a university if people were always rallying there. that even though literally the property of the university is the public sphere, it, they're it's allowed. not a public sphere, it's an institution. And it's dedicated to the purposes of the institution, and therefore its properties are determined by the properties of the institution, which is the mission of education, which demands a certain kind of critical freedom, and it also demands a certain kind of discipline. It demands a certain kind of respect, and it demands um, a certain kind of uh, restraint. I mean, all of those things within that institution. It's a complicated uh, ecosystem, but it's a different ecosystem than a park. And um, it's different than a park. And anyone who says it's like a park doesn't understand how universities work. I, it, it couldn't work if it were a park. <laughs> Could I get back to your uh, concern about the problem of, uh, of uh, respect and of distinguishing between those speakers who would be allowed, uh, as long as they were respectful, and those that appear to use uh, language that uh, goes beyond the bounds. Right. Um, some people would say, well, look at Justice Scalia's opinions, and you might think that would be beyond the bounds. Would you put a paper bag over your head when you say that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and certainly, Annapolis is often singled out. But suppose a, a university wanted to, or the administration, wanted to invite uh, Donald Trump. Now, we know a lot about Donald Trump's uh, behavior, and I wonder if you would be able to distinguish in a way that would allow you to support inviting Donald Trump, yeah. uh, even though uh, one could predict that he might well attack yes. Mexicans, uh, Jews, uh, the poor, those from... Uh, Shitty uh, countries, uh, all of those phrases seem to me to go outside the line that I think you were drawing. Yes, I mean, if, if it was a private citizen who spoke like that and did like that, um, and I expected him to talk like that, I would have no problem at all saying this person shouldn't be in a university because you, you expect someone to come in and hurl personal insults since that's inconsistent with this environment. But when the person is the President of the United States, um, he carries such educational importance because he's the President of the United States and because anyone who lives in this country has to understand him and deal with him and deal with the people who support him uh, through thick and thin. Um, I, can't, I couldn't understand an argument for keeping him from the campus. Um, there are some campuses where I'm told, you know, writing support things for Trump is viewed as hate speech. That can't be right. In any university that seeks to prepare citizens for a democracy and if that's part of the function. Now, it could be it's not part of the function, and then we were back to what your educational purpose is. But I take it any mature institution of higher education understands its public functions to be what the philosopher Amy Gutman is talking about, democratic education, preparing us to be citizens to deal with people with whom we disagree and disagree violently. Like I disagree violently with President Trump, but he's a president. And if I'm going to have to live in this country, I need to understand that phenomenon. I need to understand him. I need to understand the people who support him. And I have to talk to those people. Um, I've talked to them for the next election, or I'm dead, right? So I, can't under, I couldn't understand an educational argument to exclude him on these grounds, him, as distinct from just some you know, Joe Schmo off the street who just spouts racist epithets the way he does. Hi. 
over here. Hi. Hi sorry. Um, so it seems, based on everything that you're saying, that a university reasonably has a monopoly of force over creating a good facilitated educational environment. So to that extent, does the university have an obligation to, if a single student or an organization wants to bring one controversial speaker to campus, does the university have an obligation to find a balancing opinion or even a multitude of opinions? So is it possible for there to be um, a good environment for democratic learning when there's only a single voice in the room. Right, well, see, that goes to the point I was making before, that the university has made the decision to delegate to any student group, or all student groups, however it's done, um, to make their independent judgment. And that already answers your question, which is, it, I don't endorse it as a university, it's you endorsing it as the student organization for the educational reasons that I want to give you the responsibility of exercising your independent judgment. That has to be the way the reasoning is going. Now, if, a, if an organization has invited someone who's particularly controversial, and it causes a disruption in the educational ecosystem of the, of the university, I have a number of options as a university administrator. My last option would be to cancel the speaker because that's abandoning the policy, and that's saying, actually, my students can't be trusted to be independent. These students can't. I'm opening up myself to the judgment, I think it was you, who said, I'm exercising political discrimination, and uh, some people can be autonomous, but if you hold those views, you can't. And that's a, you know, that's a serious charge to level against the university administration. So I would take that. That's a definitely last option. What's my first option? Is to turn that controversy into educational... Uh, into an educational moment. How can I do that? I can do what you're describing. I can have alternative speakers. I can have a teach-in. I, um, I can have, as a university administrator, my own views. Murray came to talk at the Yale Law School, and we organized a competing event that students could go to if they didn't want to hear him. They could hear a different set of people with a different set of views. And I, not, we weren't obligated to do that, but we did it because it was a way to turn the moment into an educational moment rather than a moment in which people were friend-enemy in the school, which is, which is inimical to an educational environment. So just to rephrase my question slightly, I think that that's like a perfectly valid pedagogical practice. And honestly, that would be my preference as a student at a university like that. But my worry is more if you have a single controversial speaker that would come to campus... Um, would the fact that it would necessitate you bringing in multiple speakers um, in some ways mean that the university ends up endorsing the other speakers or at least saying we don't want to be affiliated with this particular set of viewpoints? I, well, look, the, the, the university has to make the, the, the decision about whether it's endorsing speakers or whether students are inviting speakers. That's your first question. So if the university has to endorse every speaker, then the university is putting itself in that position. That's a very vulnerable position, because every time a student organization asks anyone, it's you, the university, speaking, as if you're inviting them to address the graduating class. You know? That's a very awkward educational practice. So you would not want to be in that. You'd always, if you were an educational administrator, to protect yourself, you would want to be in the position that I'm giving it to all students equally, all student groups. So it would never be one. It would be all student groups. And it turns out if one is controversial, that puts us in the position that I was talking about earlier. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, so when you're talking about leaving the de like delegation at the site of the students, um, because you want them to have come some kind of like responsiveness to their own education, but isn't it the case that some students just don't like take into account the education? Like we're not in the business don't of what? we're not in the business of accounting for other people's education we're, for our fellow students' education. So in that case, are you just arguing like very harshly that like? Yeah, you have to be concerned with your own education and like be responsive to whatever you think is important to you. And thus, like if you're not taking that uh, impetus to like bring in sp outside speakers for your own education, then tough well, luck. It's not me. I'm, I'm saying, why would a university adopt the policy that student groups get to invite speakers with university money? Why would they do that and not have a veto over it and not say, justify to me that this speaker is worthwhile every time? Universities typically don't do that. They give to each student by each student group that is an officially recognized student group a certain amount of resources and say, you can use that on speakers or dinners or whatever else you want to use. That's a typical form of university governance. Why would you have that governance? 
and I'm just trying to read back out of that system what universities are trying to do. But these controversies arise, and we tend to think in the metaphor of First Amendment precisely because the educational policy behind uh, the distribution of resources in that way is not thought through. And so the university doesn't see the outside speaker serving an educational function, and that gets the First Amendment argument off the ground because it's not seen as educationally purposive. When, of course, if you draw back a little bit, it has to be educationally purposive, or the university wouldn't have been giving resources to student groups in the first place. Right? It's doing that for an educational reason. So what is that reason, and how does that relate to the speaker? And if you don't even ask that question, you're going to begin to think about it in this abstract realm of rights, which doesn't make any sense, is what I'm saying. Could you, would you be capable of reducing the set of ideas that you've presented today to a kind of speech code that would be operative in a university? Would you feel confident proposing something? Proposing? There are speech codes in university. There's codes of professional responsibility, which talk about respect in the classroom, respect of one student to another, and most respect for your colleagues as faculty. Almost every university has them, if by that is what you mean by a speech code. Yes, that exists in every university now. You know. 